All right, you sound like me, everybody. We'll begin today's virtual uh, Shema service. Praise, uh, praise belongs to Allah. We praise him and we ask him for uh, his guidance and forgiveness. We seek protection in Allah from the malice of our own souls and the evil of our actions. Whom Allah guides, no one can lead them astray. And whom he makes astray, no one can lead them back to the right path. I bear witness that there is no deity but Allah alone and with no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad uh, is the servant and messenger of Allah. You who believe, be mindful of God, as is his due, and make sure you devote yourselves to him to your, until your dying moment. Believers, be mindful of God, speak in a direct fashion and to good purpose, and he will pay your deeds right for you and forgive you your sins. Whoever obeys Allah and his messenger will truly achieve a great triumph. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Again, my dear sisters and brothers, I just want to take a moment and express uh, my extreme gratitude for the opportunity to join you all again today um, and for the safety and accessibility and health that we all have to be able to be here together. So today we're going to continue uh, our journey with the Prophet Musa Islam. The Quran is unique in that many um, of the stories of prophets that Allah reveals to us come in pieces over different surahs. And of course, this is true uh, for the for Musa's story, a prophet who is mentioned more than any other human, which is why I've been focusing on him. Um, I think this is part six uh, of the story of Musa at least the sixth time I have I have been here to talk about him. So uh, where we left off last time, uh, Musa was on his way back to Egypt with his family, and he came upon the flame on the top of a mountain. And upon venturing up, he had his first conversation with Allah, where Allah conferred prophethood on Musa and then commanded him to go to Pharaoh, go to go speak to Pharaoh. Um, in the Quran narrates several conversations between Musa and Pharaoh. Uh, one of the most detailed accounts is in chapter 26, Ashura, which is entitled The Poets. Uh, and this is primarily what I'm going to be um, sharing with you all is the English translation of a chunk from uh, the 26th surah of the chapter of the Quran. Um, and, and this surah starts out with God speaking to the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and ensuring him that his job is to spread the message and not worry when people don't do not heed that message. And this is part of God's plan, because if God wanted to do it differently, he would have sent a message differently, right? If God wanted every, and it says this in, in the surah, um, that if he, if, if Allah says, if I wanted, if we wanted everyone to believe, we would have sent it down. Uh, and I'm totally paraphrasing, which I shouldn't, but um, where your, your heads are bent in humility. Um, anyway, so the first nine verses are directly addressing the Prophet Muhammad, and then the story shifts to the story of Musa. And so we're going to start with verse 10, where it says, Your Lord called to Musa, go to the wrongdoers, the people of Pharaoh. Will they not take heed? Musa said, My Lord, I feel fear that they will call me a liar, and I feel stressed and tongue-tied, so send Aaron too. Besides, they have a charge against me, and I fear they may kill me. God said, No, go, both of you, with our signs. We shall be with you listening. Go both of you to Pharaoh and say, we bring a message from the Lord of the world. Let the children of Israel leave with us. The surah continues. Pharaoh said, did we not bring you up as a child among us? Did you not stay with us for many years? And then you committed that crime of yours? You were so ungrateful. Musa replied, I was misguided when I did it. And I fled from you in fear. Later, my Lord gave me wisdom and made me one of his messengers. And it is this, that you enslave the children of Israel, the favor with which you reproach me? Pharaoh asked, what is this Lord of the worlds? Musa replied, he is the Lord of the heavens and earth and everything between them. If you would only have faith. Pharaoh said to those present, do you hear what he says? Musa said, he is your Lord and the Lord of your forefathers. And Pharaoh said, this messenger who has been sent to you is truly possessed. Musa continued, Lord of the East and West and everything in between, if only you would use your reason. But Pharaoh said to him, if you take any other God, if you take any God other than me, I will throw you into prison. And Musa asked, even if I show you something convincing, 
Show it then, said Pharaoh, if you are telling the truth. So again, though that those that's verses 10 through 31, um, straight from the Quran. And so what we see here is Musa approaching Pharaoh and speaking kindly and patiently about God, about God's mercy, about God's paradise. And then he requests that Pharaoh releases the children of Israel out of bondage and allows them to leave with Musa and Harun. Of course, Pharaoh is going to react with, uh, you know, disdain and arrogance. And then he reminds Musa of his past crime and asks Musa to be grateful that he was raised in the palace among amongst luxuries and wealth, right? He's, he's, um, he responds in a way that is trying to humiliate Musa. Musa responds then by saying, you know, he excused himself. He, he makes excuses for himself saying that he committed the crime of killing an innocent man when he was ignorant. And he points out that he was raised in the palace only because he was unable to live with his own family due to Pharaoh's indiscriminate killing of baby boys. So then Pharaoh begins mocking Musa. Then, he, you know, he accuses him of being ungrateful. And then he finally threatens him, right? I'll throw you in prison. And in prison uh, for Pharaoh was not the most pleasant, uh, pleasant place, right? It wasn't like a cell where you had visitation even between glass, right? It was it was a hole in the desert where you were just dropped in this hole and left to be maybe maybe given some small bits of food, but you were pretty much just left in this hole. Um, and um, and so that that was the, that was how how Pharaoh responded, right? And so then Musa says, you know, look, can I show you something? And we have to remember that you know back in this time and place, many people in Egypt practiced magic. Um, it was sort of the, the power currency that was used to garner support or submissiveness from the masses. And there were even schools teaching classes in magic and illusion. And this is why uh, that this is why God bestows uh, Musa with the ability to perform the miracles, right? This was as a means to lure Pharaoh into a situation into a situation where the truth will be on full display. So verse 32 continues this interaction between Musa and Pharaoh. So, Moses, so Musa threw down his staff, and lo and behold, it became a snake for everyone to see. Then he drew out his hand, and lo and behold, it was white for the onlookers to see. Pharaoh said to the counselors around him, this man is a learned sorcerer. He means to use his sorcery to drive you out of your land. What do you suggest? They answered, delay him and his brother for a while, and send messengers to all the cities to bring every accomplished sorcerer to you. The sorcerers were to be assembled at the appointed time on a certain day, and the people were asked, are you all coming? We may follow the sorcerers if they win. When the sorcerers came back, they said to Pharaoh, shall we be rewarded if we win? And he said, yes, you will join my inner court. Musa said to them, throw down whatever you will. They threw down their ropes and their staff saying, by Pharaoh's might, we shall be victorious. But Musa threw his staff and lo and behold, it swallowed up their trickery. And the sorcerers fell down on their knees, exclaiming, We believe in the Lord of the worlds, the Lord of Moses and Aaron. And Pharaoh said, How dare you believe in him before I have given you permission? You must be the master. He must be the master who taught you the sorcery. Soon you will see I will cut off your alternate hands and feet and then crucify the lot of you. So it ends there uh, with verse 49. So we know Musa threw down his, his stick and it became a serpent, right? Slithering and sliding on the ground. And then he withdrew his hand from his cloak, and it was a bright light. Um, and so Pharaoh then assumes that these these this, that the signs man that that Musa is able to show are, are just simple, you know, magic tricks that they learned illusions that they were not, you know, allowed by Allah to be displayed. And Ibn Kathir narrates that that the Pharaoh um, when he he so then he detains Musa and Aaron. Right. And then he sent a, he dispatched couriers throughout Egypt to summon all the magicians to the palace. And Pharaoh promises the magicians prestige and money in return of their tricks. So the contest was set up between Musa and the Egyptians. Obviously, Pharaoh was very confident that the magicians were unbeatable. You know, he had long been using them to influence the heart and minds of, of the people. Pharaoh had used their conjuring tricks and illusions to dominate and control his subjects. Ibn Kathir says that it was Musa who was able to set the day for the contest, and he chose a customary festival day. 
uh, the streets would be covered uh, with people and the power and strength of God would be visible to all. There would be maximum exposure to the truth of the words and there was none worthy of worship except God alone. In Surah Al-Taha, there's three verses that sort of lay out um, kind of what happens next. O Musa, have you come to drive us out from our land with your magic? We can also show you magic to match it. So set an appointment between us and you, which neither we nor, nor you shall forget to keep in a fair open place. Musa said, let the encounter be on the day of adornment and let the people assemble at forenoon. So the day has come. Musa starts and he asks the magician to perform their magic first. And it's narrated that there were up to 70 magicians lined up in a row. And the magicians threw their sticks and their ropes in the name of Pharaoh. And uh, the ground became a seething sea of serpents, writhing and slithering. The crowd looked on in, in amazement. Musa was afraid, but he was also steadfast, right? Because he didn't, he didn't contain the capacity to perform magic on his own, right? He had to have this trust in Allah, that Allah would protect him and make his task easy. And, and Allah then covered Musa with tranquility and directed him to throw his stick. Musa's stick then transformed into a huge serpent and quickly devoured all the illusionary serpents that covered the ground. And the crowd rose up like a great wave, cheering and shouting for Musa. The magicians were astonished. They were well skilled in the art of magic and illusion, for they were the best magicians in the world at that time. But their conjuring was nothing but a trick, right? It was just an illusion. The magicians knew that Musa's serpent was real. They collectively fell into prostration, declaring their belief, belief in the Lord of Musa and Harun. The magicians began um, that day as disbelievers, corrupt and interested only in riches and fame. However, within a few hours, they had recognized the truth. They saw that with their own eyes, the omnipotence of God and repented for their errant ways. And this serves as a reminder that God is the most merciful. And he will forgive those who turn to him with sincere and humble repentance. Musa and Harun left the contest field. The magicians, as it's told, were put to death. Their bodies hung in the squares and marketplaces to teach the people of less, uh, to teach the people a lesson. Pharaoh returned to his palace, and his rage magnified. I say the saying of mine, I seek forgiveness from Allah for me and for you and for the rest of Muslims. So ask him for forgiveness. He is the forgiver, the merciful. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, ala rasul Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the name of Allah and exaltations be to Allah and blessings and peace be upon the messenger of Allah. So this is the story, the part of Musa that we're, the story of the Musa that we are just going to cover today. We're not going to go further into how Pharaoh then reacts and what he does. We'll save that, inshallah, for the next time. Um, and, you know, I, I, I primarily shared with you a large chunk of verses um, from one surah, Surah Ashura, the poets. And this surah feels so powerfully uh, timely when I read what Muhammad Asad wrote in the opening synopsis of it. Muhammad Asad says, the main purport of this surah lies in its stress on the unchanging character of humans' weakness and proneness to self-deception, which explains why the great majority of people at all times and in all communities so readily reject the truth, whether it be the truth of God's messages or of self-evident moral values, and in consequence, lose themselves in a worship of power, wealth, and what is commonly described as glory, as well as in the mindful, mindless acceptance of slogans and prevailing fashions of thought. I, I read that and it blew my mind. And I don't mean to get political here, okay, but Wow. <laughs> uh, I don't know if this could align any more to what we are currently living through at this moment. You know, last night was the culmination of a four night magic show where empty slogans and so called prevailing fashions of thought were on full display. You know, when we look at Pharaoh, 
right? We, we can see that he was so evil and arrogant that he genuinely believed he was unstoppable and was the supreme master of his people. He wasn't afraid of the truth because he really believed that he was the truth. He allowed an audience with Musa, okay, because he believed he would overpower him. He would be able to exert his control and dominance over him. And of course, we know Musa had something that Pharaoh didn't, and that was the humility in trusting Allah. You know, Professor Khalid Abu Fadl in his tafsir of this surah explains, similar to what Muhammad Asad alluded to, that the underlying message of this surah, and by default, this part of the story of Musa, right, is, is that despotism and oppression are violently opposed to the Quranic message. There is no room for dictatorial control of a people or an oppression of a people within the boundaries of Islam, okay? Now, my understanding is that Pharaoh is the perfect example of what a despot looks like. Allah, men Allah mentions Pharaoh so many times, and of course, not to praise him, obviously, or to give him any undue attention. But rather, Pharaoh is described and, and taught in the Quran as a means to show us the signs of what a despot looks like and what and how oppression and injustice manifests in our world. You know, as an average person just trying to survive each day and live a life of peace, it may seem a little like out of touch or distant to worry about becoming a despot or a dictator. You know, and yes, it's fair to say that we all hold some power over others or over another of God's creation so that any of us could, you know, technically fall trap into exhibiting for, you know, some form of oppression. Um, but but that's not what I want to talk about today. It's not really what I want to concern, concern ourselves with at this moment. And again, let's look back at the wisdom of Muhammad Asad, who said, you know, man's weakness, human's weakness and proneness to self-deception which explains why the great majority of people at all times and in all communities so readily reject the truth, whether it be God, the truth of God's message or of self-evident moral values, and in consequence, lose themselves in a worship of power or wealth. Pause on that for a minute. We can lose ourselves and start to worship power and wealth. And do we not do that? Even, even those of us who believe, you know, who, who call ourselves believers, there are moments we can admit that we fall prey to that, that worship of power and wealth. So we have to remind ourselves that we have that innate weakness, that proneness to forget or reject the truth because of a tendency to allow ourselves, allow ourselves to be so infatuated and engrossed with the power of ourselves or, or even worse, that of others. So I just wanna close out here by connecting the bits and pieces, okay? So Pharaoh was the epitome of arrogance and, and injustice, right? I think we can agree to that. Yet yeah, he brought Musa out on stage, right? He believed that Musa would fall flat on his face and that um, you know, by doing that, that would provide an opportunity to throw him away, you know, into a prison cell or a whole prison hole, right? Or just kill him. And then he'd be, that'd be the end of this nuisance. Even though, remember, the Pharaoh who believed that there would be a, a boy from the children of Israel who will destroy him, okay? He had that fear and he thought he dealt with it, that there's nothing left. Because Pharaoh was the furthest from the truth that any human can be, right? Where there is truth, if you imagine truth as like a sphere, you know, Pharaoh is as far as any human could be from it. He was so overtaken by his delusions that he couldn't see the truth even when it was thrown right in front of him. You know, and, and like I mentioned, this week, okay, I'm not going to name names, but this week there was a showcase of so-called power and wealth that was all dressed up in costumes of self-righteous slogans and delusions of prevailing thought, all of which are tools that are used to suppress the truth, both covertly and directly. You know, those allowed on stage believe that they could mask the truth use, using, you know, magical words and illusions, and therefore they could retain their power. 
But what sets them apart from Pharaoh is that they know the truth is out there and they cannot bear for it to be revealed, right? These people could not chance allowing someone who may reveal the truth on stage, even if it's just by their mere presence. They couldn't chance it. They couldn't risk it in front of such a grand audience. They are so frightened by the truth that they would go to any lengths to bury it in a hole if they could or to drop a 2,000 bomb upon it just to make it go away. But they, unlike Pharaoh, do indeed know their words and actions are not the truth. And so we as believers, we have to recognize this and have faith in Allah that the truth will be presented one day in the most undeniable way. And may we all be on the side of truth, always and forever. O oh Allah, please accept our good deeds and our good intentions, forgive our shortcomings and missteps, and allow us to experience many more moments together. O oh Allah, grant us the good things in this world and the good things in the next life, and save us from the punishment of the hereafter. Uh, save us from the punishment of the fire. O oh Allah, aid us in accepting the trials and tribulations of this life, and give us the strength to overcome any challenge we may face. O oh Allah, I ask that you present justice one day, justice in a way that no human can deliver to the people who have been oppressed. O Allah, we hope for your mercy. Do not leave us to ourselves, even for the blinking of an eye. Correct each of our affairs for us. There is none worthy of worship but you. If I have said anything of truth, it is from Allah alone, and my gratitude goes to Allah. And if I have said anything that was not of truth, then that is from my own ego, and I ask for forgiveness for that transgression. Amin.